Hello, this is Professor Lenis. We are going to uh, prepare some demonstrations for the labs so you can follow your procedure according with the protocol that is online. You can download this from the website. I'm going to explain you every step. So my recommendation is prepare this document in front of you and you follow what we are doing here. You are going to do the actual demonstration for the experiment. Three parts. First, we are going to follow the handout from the website. That's the website that you get the handout. And the experiment we are going to do is the empirical formula of a copper oxide. What is the objective? The objective is to find the empirical formula of a copper oxide. We have two options of copper oxide. We are going to discuss that later. And the materials you're going to need are solid copper oxide. I'll show you that. Zinc metal in a hydrogen generator barrel and also three molar sulfuric acid we will need a large test tube brand new a small test tube two beakers 100 ml each we will need a Bunsen burner also calcium sulfate in a drying tube let's talk about safety uh, before we continue what are the safety precautions for this lab? We need to wear safety goggles, like those. Also, we need to wear gloves. I'm wearing now nitrile, uh, nitrile gloves. And just follow the uh, pro uh, instructions. All right, so let me show you what we have here, step by step, on your handout. Again, I would recommend have this ready. You can pause the video, get this document in front of you, and then you follow step by step what we are doing here. So the purpose is to find the formula of a copper oxide. You may have this copper 1 oxide or copper 2 oxide. Our job is to find which one of those we have. How? Here is the way we are going to do it. We know that copper oxide reacts with hydrogen gas to form copper solid. This is pure copper solid and we all know the color of the copper solid. Also we will get as a byproduct water, gas. Another way to do this is using carbon monoxide. Today we are going to do the demonstration using only hydrogen gas. How do we get the hydrogen gas? That's why we are going to use a gas generator. A gas generator uses this reaction. Aqueous sulfuric acid solution, we are going to use three molar solution, and solid zinc metal. That reaction, and we know the reaction of any active metal and a strong acid forms hydrogen gas. And this is the hydrogen gas we are going to use here. The byproduct is a salt, zinc sulfate. I'm going to stop here and then we go to do the actual lab. Hello. This is Professor Lenis. So we are going to do the demonstration for finding the copper oxide formula. Safety first, goggles on. 
gloves, coat. Materials. We're going to use the following materials. Here we have a gas generator. Inside we have zinc metal. You see, it's shiny. All metals are shiny. Good conductors of electricity and heat. Over here, we attached something that we call a drying tube. The function of this part of the apparatus is to trap the water that comes out of that reaction. The reaction between zinc and sulfuric acid. Here is the sulfuric acid. We have three molar solution sulfuric acid. I took already 60 ml, about 60 ml of sulfuric acid doesn't need to be precisely measured, that's why using a beaker. I also, as you can see, I clamp my gas generator because at this time I don't have a partner to hold it. It's safe, it's not going to tip over, and we are going to do a secure experiment. Also, it is attached to this tube. You can see the tube here, we already measured the mass of the empty tube, and I'm going to write these numbers at the end on your handout. We measured the empty test tube, and then we added some mass. The value of that mass is between 1.8 grams and 2 grams of a copper oxide. Remember, we don't know if we have copper one oxide or copper two oxide. We'll find that out later. Let me show you the appearance of that copper oxide. As you can see, it's a black powder, just like that. So that is the material you can see here inside, that's the copper to oxide. And we have a tube passing through this desiccator that goes over here. And I want, to, I want to show you the rest of the tube. It's just like this. You see? The tube brings the gas hydrogen gas from the gas generator to here and also we have a small tube right here and that goes inside like that it's secured there we clamp it this way next to the rim of the test tube this piece of tube, this nozzle, points up. You will see later the function of that. So we are pretty much ready to start the experiment. We have the Bunsen burner here. I will start lighting this up. Turn the gas on. This position is off. This position is on. Turn the gas on. With the striker, I light the Bunsen burner and I can regulate the amount of gas using this bulb or the amount of air getting into the Burner. So that's the type of flame we are looking for. Two cones. The inner blue cone and the outer lighter blue cone. The hardest part of the flame 
is the tip of the inner cone. I can demonstrate that the inner cone is actually cold. As you can see, the inner part of the cone is colder, the tip of the inner cone is harder. Alright, we continue here, it's showing the hardest part of the flame is the tip of the inner cone. You can see there, that is the tip of the inner cone, the hardest part of the flame. And that is the part we are going to use to heat the copper oxide. Alright, let's explain the reactions. The first reaction is the reaction that occurs inside the gas generator. Inside we have solid zinc, which is an active metal, and we are going to add a solution of trimolar sulfuric acid. That reaction produces gas hydrogen and water. And it's a very active reaction. So we are going to control, we are going to check the temperature. This is a, an exothermic reaction, that means it releases heat. When a reaction releases heat, that's a good indication of a strong reaction. Releasing heat is actually a driving force for any chemical reaction. Also, the formation of gas is another type of driving force that pushes the reaction to go forward. I'm going to add some of the sulfuric acid and I'm going to get the infrared thermometer. I'm going to check the temperature. There's nothing here inside, just the solid sink. And I'll tell you what is the temperature. You can see probably here the temperature. But the glass right now is showing 70.0 point, 70 Fahrenheit. Did you see it? What is that? What temperature is showing there? 69.6 it looks like. Okay. We'll see this increase in temperature after we have uh, sulfuric acid. If you're going to add sulfuric acid, you will see formation of the gas there, generate the gas. The gas, hydrogen gas, will displace the air from the tube from here, and then the hydrogen gas will come out here. We want to have a hydrogen gas atmosphere inside the tube. That hydrogen gas will displace the oxygen from the copper oxide, leaving behind the pure copper, the copper metal. We'll see that transformation by the color change. Color change also is a good indicator that a chemical reaction is happening. We'll observe that here. I'm going to add now the sulfuric acid just a little bit to get this started. I'm going to add about half of this volume slowly. Remember when we have we are working with concentrated acids or bases we need to handle that very careful. Slowly. So that should be enough. And you can see the reaction already started. I'm going to move it a little bit to create, to create more contact between the acid and the metal. And temperature at this point should start to rise. A 
Let me know what temperature is now. 72.5. I'm going up. So that proves that we have an exothermic reaction. Let's go to this part. Let's see what's, what's going on here. I'm going to collect the gas. Remember here we are, this reaction is generating hydrogen gas and also water. However, we have a water trap that will collect all the water formed here and let only hydrogen go through this tube. So I'm going to collect something there. I hope that is hydrogen gas. How do we know we have hydrogen gas? We are going to do a hydrogen gas test. That is the, re the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. That produces a pop sound. That's why it is called the pop hydrogen gas test. It is called also the hydrogen barking. Let's see if we have enough hydrogen gas in that tube. Did you hear it? Look. So it's on. You can see the flame. I hope you can see the flame there. I'm going to put this background there. Can you see it? That means that yes, we are generating hydrogen gas and the tube is filled only with hydrogen gas and the extra hydrogen gas is coming out here and is reacting right now with oxygen present in the air. That proves that we have another chemical reaction there. The reaction of hydrogen gas and oxygen to form water. We are ready to start the reaction because that's all what we need. We have the copper oxide, solid. We have the hydrogen gas, but we need to activate these two so they can start making the reaction. We need to introduce some heat, some energy. Let me add a little bit more of hydrogen to keep this active. And you can see the flame here. As I add more acid, it increases the formation of gas. So again, we need to activate these two components, hydrogen gas and the copper oxide, which is the black oxide. How do we activate them to start the reaction? Are in heat. Heat is energy, and that will increase the activation energy right enough to start the reaction. You do not hold the Bunsen burner from here because look what happened with the flame. You block the entrance of air to the Bunsen burner. You're going to, I'm adjusting the flame. So you hold the Bunsen burner from the base. And I will start heating slowly from bottom to top. Before I do that, you can notice that the tube is tilted bottom up. You may ask why. The reason is that this reaction, again, is between hydrogen gas and copper oxide, and that reaction will generate water too. Most of the water vapor will come out here but some water vapor will remain inside the tube. And eventually, that water will condense here. We don't want that water there. If we don't tilt this, that water will go back and react with the products or byproducts of the first reaction. That's why we need to tilt it 
to accumulate the water condensation here, and we are going to dry that out. So let me start with the heating, the slow, very slow heating at the beginning. Right there. And I start to increase the heat using the tip of the inner cone. And I start going up very slowly. That way. I want to focus the heat on the copper oxide I have there and as you can see there's some, something happening there like color change so we know for sure that a chemical reaction is occurring inside now the question is when do I need to stop heating the copper oxide? And the answer is that we stop heating when see total conversion of the copper oxide. In other words, the black powder we have inside should be converted totally into copper metal. And what is the color of the copper metal? Did you see any color over there? Color change? I see like a red brown color in the new material and I can say that the new material is copper copper metal we need to add enough heat to convert all copper oxide the black stuff into copper metal, the red brown stuff. That's why I need to move the flame all around to make sure the total conversion, that the reaction is complete. I still have, I still see some black material here. This takes about 5 to 10 minutes to get a complete reaction. Hi, so we finished heating this uh, material up. As you can see, everything was converted into a new red brownish material and that is the solid copper here i have some extra solid copper this is the copper we got remember we started with the black copper oxide and with the help of hydrogen gas we converted that into pure copper I was talking about the formation of some water. You get a close look here inside the tube, we'll see that water, which is a byproduct of that reaction. I'm going to take this out very careful here, right there. 
and this is this is done and here we have some water there is so some water coming out here it's wet and I'm going to wipe that water out we don't want that I let this to cool down enough to get this out if I do, what happens if I don't let it cool? Well, oxygen from air will go back and react with hot copper and will form the copper oxide and we have to start over. Everything is cold now and I'm going to get the water. Hope you can see the water vapor there. And that's what I wa we want to to get. So we we'll wipe that out. Now that we get the water out, I think it's still a little bit more there. Okay. Now we can take this down and we can bring it up and there's no risk to get water up down there. Next is to weigh this again and then we can proceed with calculations. I'll show you the data we have. That's the third part, our data. So let's go to the whiteboard. I'll show you the measurements. Hi, let's continue with the calculations after we do the experiment. Remember, we have the test tube, it was hot, we let it cool, we took the condensation of water from the tube, but when doing that, I noticed that I have some black stuff there also. That means there was a, some of the copper oxide that didn't react. We need to take this into consideration because that will introduce some error in our measurements. That will help us to explain the source of that error. Some unreacted copper oxide. Right, here are the numbers. First, we measure the mass of the empty tube. Empty tube. And using an analytical balance, we got this measurement 20.8062 grams. So notice that we are measuring up to tenth of milligrams. That is the precision of the scale we are using. We are using a scale precision plus or minus 0 0.0001. Grams. And all our measurements will be done on the same scale. The mass of copper oxide plus test tube is 22.5450 grams. We did the reaction, and after the reaction, we have the mass of copper and test tube, which is this. And that mass is 22.1919 grams. From there, you can calculate 
the mass of copper oxide. Oh, by subtraction of these two. And then you can calculate the mass of copper. How? By the subtraction of this and this. The mass of copper and test tube and the mass of empty test tube. And now you have enough information to calculate the mass of copper and from there by difference you can calculate the mass of oxygen present initially in the copper oxide and then you follow the instructions find the mass of copper using atomic mass of copper from your periodic table then find the moles of oxygen using the atomic mass of oxygen from the periodic table and you can find the empirical formula of copper oxide. In your handout, explaining how to calculate the empirical formula of copper oxide using the data you have. And stay tuned for the next experiment.